is blaspheming the name of Jesus while Christians sit back and say nothing. For many who reject the Bible as truth and Jesus Christ as their Savior, blaspheming our Lord is something they do without conscience or any fear of repercussions. Entertainers like George Carlin, Bill Maher, Rosie, many others have openly mocked and blasphemed Christ their entire careers to the laughs and cheers of those who listen to them. Others have used their God-given gifts and talents to publicly blaspheme the Lord through books, motion pictures, music, and art. As the years have rolled by and the nation gets further away from God and biblical values, the blaspheming of Jesus gets more frequent, more bold, and more disgusting. Many have used their imaginations to creatively blaspheme the Lord in every way possible while Christians sit back in virtual silence. Paul Verhoeven, the director of Basic Instinct, the Sharon Stone movie, and other motion pictures, will soon be releasing a biography of Jesus where he makes the shocking claim that Christ was probably the son of Mary and a Roman soldier who raped her during the Jewish uprising in Galilee and says that Christ was not betrayed by Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 original apostles of Jesus, as the New Testament states. Verhoeven, who is Catholic and holds a doctorate in mathematics and physics from the University of Leiden, was a regular attendee of the Jesus Seminar. That seminar, something I've warned people about for years, calls into questions miracles and statements attributed to Jesus in the Bible and rejects the divinity of Christ. Also on the blaspheming Jesus front is B. Hussein Obama advisor Larry Lessig, a Stanford University law professor who includes in his lecture a video of a gay Jesus sashaying nearly naked down a city street to the tune of Gloria Gators. I will survive only to get run over by a bus. We know from the Bible that in the fulfillment of Scripture he was mocked and scorned in the last hours of his life. So many of the supposed lost books of the Bible and these new Gospels are nothing more than the anti-Christian writings of men who rejected the message of Christ and who he is. Those anti-Christian writings have always existed throughout the last 2,000 years, right up to today with the modern-day heretics like Dan Brown, the author of The Da Vinci Code, Michael Bajant, who wrote the equally blasphemous Jesus papers. People have mocked our Lord since the days he walked this earth. What is new is the bold and fearless public attacks on our Lord throughout the world today. I've told you often that the United States is no longer a Christian nation. A classic example of that fact is the way those who hate Jesus publicly mock him. Just 10 years ago, no legitimate publisher would print a book full of such vile lies about the Lord. 10 years ago, no no law school professor would be using such disgusting depictions of Christ in their lectures. What we're seeing with the open and public mocking of Jesus is one of the results of our abandoning the culture of our day, leaving it to the devil. He operates virtually without any opposition, so why are we surprised that he has taken his hatred and scorn for Jesus to the extremes we witness today? Let me warn you, my friend, it's only going to get worse. The answer to this blaspheming of our Lord is to get back out into the marketplace. Start taking a stand for Christ. Each follower of the Lord can do their part each day, where you live, where you go to school or work, where you shop, and the recreational activities you're involved in with the people God brings across your path each day. Take your stand by living a godly and holy life. Take your stand by not being afraid to speak up for our Lord when you're around people who are speaking against Him. You take your stand by finding ways you can serve him. You can't stop the mockers, but you can make sure their message of hatred for our Lord doesn't go unchallenged. While the world mocks our Lord, we've got to praise him. While the world blasphemes our Lord, we have to lift up his name. Our second item tonight is a biblical case for war. Let me go back to the Old Testament where you had the children of Israel who were at a place where the people groups living around them had the sole desire to wipe them off the face of the earth. They did not want peace. They only wanted total dominance. They weren't interested in being neighbors. 
They want to destroy the children of Israel, take their land, and they wanted to be in total power. Well, let me tell you something, my friend. We have that same phenomenon today. You've got to understand, those people who want to see this nation obliterated from the very map, want to see you and me dead, have no desire for peace. That's what people don't seem to understand. It takes two to have peace. And we are at a place where we have a very real enemy that doesn't desire peace, only our total annihilation. So we really have two choices. We either take the offensive or we sit back and do nothing and get obliterated. Is war something God enjoys? Absolutely not. Does God want us to be in war? Absolutely not. But we have every right and we have every responsibility to defend ourselves from people who aren't interested in peace, only interested in our total annihilation. Let me say that one more time. We have every right, and our government has the sole responsibility of protecting us, of keeping us safe. So I understand that the war has many detractors. I understand the peace without war, Pollyannish views of, uh, of many would love for there to be no war. But even Jesus said that you will have wars, rumors of wars, until the end of the day. Sadly, there are people that don't have a desire for peace. They have no desire to live peaceably with others. They only have a desire for total domination. We have a very real enemy out there that doesn't want peace. Only our annihilation. And once again, we have every right, we have every responsibility to not only defend ourselves, but to keep our nation safe. Lastly tonight, I want to talk to you about the economy. And I want to proffer for you tonight something to ponder. I have stated for a long time now that we are not only due God's judgment, we are overdue God's judgment. If for no other reason, forget the fact that we worship the false gods and idols of the world. Forget the fact that homosexuality and other sexual sin is rampant. Forget the fact that we just absolutely live in utter rebellion to God and his word. If nothing else, the fact that this nation legally slaughters 4,000 innocent babies every single day is reason enough to expect God's judgment on this nation. Let me tell you, I want to proffer to you tonight very quickly for you to ponder the fact that God could easily use the economy as an instrument of his judgment. Just tweak the economy a little bit, and this nation could be in a position most people couldn't even fathom. Do you know that China basically owns this nation now? They've been buying up our debt, buying up our debt, buying up our debt. Guess what? If they're buying up our debt, that means we owe China. And if they ever decided to sell our dollars and, and, and flood the world, the dollar, is, as bad as it is now, could absolutely crash. I submit to you tonight, it would be worse than any tsunami. It would be worse than any earthquake, any hurricane. It would be worse than 109 11s all at the same time. It would be felt from shore to shore, from coast to coast, from border to border, and everywhere in between. So I want you to ponder how God could very easily use the economy as a form of his judgment on this nation for our wickedness. And again, if you don't think this is a wicked nation, wake up, my friend. If you don't think this nation is due, no, overdue God's judgment, wake up, my friend.